Welcome everyone to today's discussion, launching the January, February issue of Foreign Affairs. I'm Kate Brannon, the magazine's deputy editor, and I'm thrilled to be here moderating today for what I know is gonna be an excellent conversation about cyber threats. I recently joined Foreign Affairs and this issue was the first one that I got to work on. And it was a real honor to work with some of today's guests that we have um, and all of uh, everybody here today contributed an essay to this, to this issue. We're joined by Dmitry Alperovich, uh, the co-founder of CrowdStrike. He's also served as a special advisor at the Defense Department. And today he's the co-founder and chair of Silverado Policy Accelerator. We're also joined by Joe Nye, the former Dean of the Kennedy School at Harvard. He's served at the State Department and the Pentagon, and he's written countless books about that have changed sort of the way we view the world and international relations. He's currently the University Distinguished Professor Emeritus at Harvard. And we're joined by Jacqueline Schneider, who's a fellow at the Harvard, at the Hoover Institution, excuse me, at Stanford University. And she spent six years uh, as an Air Force officer and is currently a reservist assigned to Space Systems Command. We were also supposed to be joined by Eric Rosenbach, but unfortunately he was able, unable to join us at the last minute. But we still have a great mix of perspectives here with us today, um, years of government, academic, and private sector expertise that we're gonna tap into as we discuss both what um, all of these experts wrote about for our issue and then, and then things that are going on in the world today. I'll lead the discussion for the first half and then we're gonna throw it open to questions from the audience. And um, Jackie, I wanted to start with you to, to frame our conversation. You wrote about how for years, Washington has warned about the potential physical, uh, destructive physical effects that cyber attacks could have, um, including the famous warning from then Defense Secretary Leon Panetta about a potential cyber Pearl Harbor. And I think that warning, it's, it's lodged so clearly in everyone's memories. I think it might have been in every single essay, there was like a reference to it in every essay in our, in our issue. Um, but you note in your piece that many of these warnings didn't come to pass um, and that instead what's happened is in some ways more insidious and more damaging. Um, describe what you see as the true threats from cyber that emanate from cyberspace. Yeah, you know, that idea that cyber would create this immediate large scale effect really captured the imagination and the attention, which is, I think, what it was designed to do. The problem was that big event never occurred. And instead, we had these um, overwhelming increase in low scale cyber activity that actually had extraordinary consequences for economic activity. Um, also for governance. Um, and in general, what it's doing is it's degrading the, the trust that we have on digital markets, on governance in the modern era, and even international cooperation. And so it's how it degrades that trust that we have in these modern digital systems that really is the overall factor, an existential threat that cyber plays to modern societies. I thought one thing that um, was so interesting about what you described was learning to live with failure, that there, rather than put so much effort into preventing these attacks, it's almost, you know, a, a futile, a, a futile effort, um, that it's more important to focus on building resilience. Um, could you talk about how you build resilience, both at the technical level, um, you know, into machines, which you write about, but also at the societal level, which, as you described, is, is a much harder task? Yeah, and I think resiliency is going to be the core concept for the United States beyond cyber going forward. So in cyber, this has many different dimensions. I mean, technical resiliency is about building different types of networks, about creating backups, about um, creating um, analog uh, procedures or the ability you know, in the military uh, to operate without digital connectivity. Um, and I think kind of the, the most expensive and the difficult part of resilience is you're, you're basically making yourself either less effective less effective um, over the short term or kind of more costly. Um, and so you're investing in training, you're investing in manpower. And then as a society, this idea of resilience as society is really difficult. And the way that cyber affects information and how we interact with each other, is extremely complicated. And this is kind of the, the really difficult part is how do you make societies more resilient to these types of threats? Um, and that probably has to do less with the technical, 
and more about how human beings interact outside the digital community. Um, a common thread through all the pieces was a sense that the United States had almost misdiagnosed the problem or that there's something, there's something off about the current strategy or the way that the problem is being viewed. So to shift to, to your essay, Dimitri, you talk about how um, cyber threats are often viewed as sort of a distinct national security problem that should be addressed with uniquely cyber solutions, but instead they're really symptoms of these larger geopolitical problems. Could you walk us through um, the threats that come from China and Iran and Russia and how, um, how they use cyber to further their own geopolitical aims. Well, I've said a long time ago that I don't think that we have a cyber problem. I, will, I think we have a Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea problem and cyber is an element of the landscape uh, of our geopolitical struggle <clears throat> with those four primary adversaries that we face. It's not, it does not mean that all of the attacks that we face come from those four countries, but the vast majority of either nation state directed attacks against our institutions and our private sector are coming from the state-owned um, um, entities <clears throat> within those governments, their military intelligence agencies, and uh, <clears throat> from criminals that uh, are allowed to operate uh, uh, often with impunity from those countries um, that continue to target us. There's certainly many other criminals around the world as well, but uh, we're able to often find them and arrest them fairly quickly um, and uh, keep that problem to manageable level. But um, what we're not able to do is, of course, deal with the threats that emanate from those four countries, which is why they've continued to rise in their significance in terms of impact. <clears throat> so when you look at each of those four countries, they use cyber in very different ways uh, to accomplish their strategic objectives. When it comes to China, they're very much focused on continuing to build out their economic power and uh, using cyber to steal intellectual property, uh, both commercial intellectual property from private companies, um, as well as uh, intellectual property related to national security systems, uh, defense, and, and other applications. And they've been doing that for 20 plus years now, uh, quite successfully, and, and have stolen uh, what, what is probably trillions of dollars of intellectual property. So when you sort of step back and, and, and look beyond just the cyber operations that they're conducting, what becomes very clear is that they're essentially waging a trade war against us uh, by um, trying to outcompete us uh, with this uh, theft of intellectual property uh, that's taking place on an unprecedented scale. With Russia, it's very different. Um, the Russians are very adept at, um, adept at uh, using coercion uh, to accomplish the objectives or to attempt to, uh, to accomplish the objectives. So many of the attacks that we're seeing from the Russians uh, in terms of the Russian government involve uh, disruption, uh, in, involve uh, active measures operations, influence campaigns like what we saw against the US election in 2016, against the French election in 2017, against uh, Ukrainian elections. And then of course, disruptive attacks like the ones that they had launched against Ukraine over the last eight years and like the ones that we will probably see in the near future um, if, um, if they do decide to invade that country. Um, and, and of course, Russia has also uh, uh, kept a uh, uh, blind eye to the fact that uh, uh, a huge number of cyber criminals are operating within their borders, including ransomware criminals, and they've traditionally not taken any action against them, uh, except for last week when they did arrest uh, 14 members of the Arrival ransomware gang that was famously responsible for the Kaseya and J JBS attacks last summer. But um, even uh, I've argued in e even those actions um, that are really unprecedented for the Russian government to take, and they said that they did so in response to U.S. demands, um, I think you cannot separate from the broader geopolitical struggle that we're engaged in with Russia and uh, the fact that they're trying to um, essentially engage in this ransomware diplomacy right now by sending a signal to the Biden administration of, you can get help from us on these criminals that we've traditionally not acted on, but don't you dare uh, try to sanction us over anything we, we may do to Ukraine. So that, that's um, sort of a, a brief overview of, of the main actors that we face um, in cyberspace. <clears throat> okay. Um, Professor Nye, I wanted to ask you a similar issue of sort of viewing cyber as somehow distinct from like the larger set of national security problems. Um, there's a lot of skepticism that any rules can be applied to cyberspace, um, that it's the Wild West. Why do you think that skepticism 
uh, exists and what do people misunderstand about norms and rules that, that do in fact apply to cyber cyberspace as they do to nuclear weapons and other things? Well, thanks, Kate. I, let me first say that I agree completely with what uh, Jackie and Dimitri have said. And you can't separate cyber from the overall relationship. It's an instrument, an instrument that countries are using. Uh, it's a different kind of instrument in the sense that it doesn't go bang uh, and it is much faster and uh, it, uh, it, you know, oceans don't protect us and uh, it's hard sometimes to attribute, but it's still an instrument of, of, uh, of the contest between powers. Then the question is, okay, if that's the case, um, you have to ask, is it possible to restrict some instruments and to uh, set some limits on them. And we try that with treaties and arms control and so forth. I don't think that's gonna be relevant in cyber because you can't tell whether a particular line of code is a weapon or not, depends on the intent of the user. On the other hand, you can look for analogies in which you say, uh, sometimes it's in the interest of a state to accept certain norms or limits. And uh, we have, historical examples of that, which I try to outline in, in my article. But I think in the case of, of uh, cyber, if you look to the example, a couple of things. Like one is during the Cold War, when we certainly had uh, bitter relations, ideological differences with the Soviet Union, uh, we developed certain norms about how we treat each other's spies. We didn't kill them. You were traded them back. Um, those became known as the Moscow rules. They weren't set down in any treaty, but it was based on prudence and the fact that each state realized that if they broke that rule, it was more costly than it was worth. Or another example is in 1972, when both the US and the Soviets were buzzing each other's ships, uh, trying to get as close as we can in terms of surveillance, as we called it, or sometimes you might call it harassment, we realized that sooner or later, one of these things was going to get out of control. And we signed the Incidents at Sea Agreement, uh, saying there are certain limits on what we're going to do. So the analogy, I think, about norms here is uh, sometimes states find that for a variety of reasons, it's in their interest to set some limits to restrain their sovereignty. One reason is coordination. Another is prudence that I've mentioned. Um, and another is that certain taboos, when you violate them, become too costly for your reputation or your soft power. And then there's another one, which I don't think is as important for Russia or China, or certainly not for North Korea, which is the evolution of, uh, of changes in domestic opinion, in the sense that after a while, certain, certain things are just not acceptable. Um, so those are at least four major reasons why states will restrain themselves. And if they've happened on things ranging from uh, slavery to biological weapons to nuclear weapons, uh, there's no reason they can't occur in cyber. But we just shouldn't have any illusions about a grand cyber arms control treaty. To stay on norms for a second, um... Where do you think we are in the evolution of cyber norms? Are we at the beginning? Are we in the middle? And what would you like to see? Like what steps have to take place in the near future to strengthen them? And are they steps that the United States should be taking or is it just a matter of time? Well, I, it's hard to, to uh, give an absolute answer to where we are in the process, but I've used the analogy of nuclear weapons. After Hiroshima, uh, we had the Baruch plan at the UN, which was a non-starter. And for two decades, we really had no limits or norms on uh, nuclear weapons. After we scared ourselves silly in the Cuban Missile Crisis in 63, Kennedy proposed that we negotiate with the Soviets the uh, limited test ban treaty, which uh, that was accomplished in 63. And in 68, we got the non-proliferation treaty again, based on the self-interest of, of the states. Uh, and in cyber, if you, if you date the, the current dom domain of cyber from, let's say, the late 1990s, from, the, from when the web becomes an essential substrate of economics and politics, 
which is a little different from the invention of the internet, which goes back several decades before that. But uh, if you date it from the late 90s, we're at about a two decade mark now. And you say, well, has anything happened? Well, yeah, in um, the Russian proposed a treaty in 98, which we rejected for good reasons. Uh, the UN then set up a group of government experts. And by 2015, they'd come up with 11 significant norms, which didn't try to limit the weapons, which you can't do, but could limit the targets. And that was consistent with existing international humanitarian law, that you don't attack civilians. So there is a process in which you have at least had states sign on to these basic norms. In addition to that, there are a lot of other norms that have been proposed. I was a member of a group called the Global Commission on Stability in Cyberspace, which reported a year or so ago with eight additional norms. And you have in the UN now an open-ended working group that's trying to incorporate uh, some of these norms and develop them further. So we're making some progress, um, but it's also true that uh, uh, norms are made to be broken. And unless you combine deterrence with the norms, uh, we're not gonna continue to make progress. To throw the, this question open to everybody, does anyone see evidence of states restraining themselves in cyberspace yet? Are there lines that, that they're not willing to cross yet? Or is a lack of deterrence sort of letting um, actors sort of have free reign? Whoever wants to take that. So yeah, I think I, there's a lot of, well, go ahead. Well, I would say, I think strategic deterrence still exists. And I think it's very hard to prove whether deterrence is existing or not existing, working or not working. But the fact that countries like Russia and China have not conducted a cyber attack on the United States that causes large scale civilian um, physical harm, I can't say that that's deterrence, but I, I think it probably is. I think there is a unspoken norm that that kind of attack would be um, extremely inappropriate and escalatory, and that might actually have credible deterrence by punishment um, retaliation options. I think that that is a lot more difficult at a lower level, and I think that there's a very different um, relationship between the United States and Russia, and Russia and Ukraine. And so things that deterrence might work for US and Russia, because it goes back to, as Dimitri said, and um, politics um, and real capabilities. Um, those might not hold for, for states that don't have the same sort of um, nuclear or even conventional deterrence options. Yeah. Dimitri, did you wanna chime in? Yeah, I, I completely agree with, with uh, uh, Jackie that um, when you look at even the actors where we have very um, um, very strained relations with, uh, like North Korea, like Iran, um, none of them have really executed, um, targeted, and I'm talking about obviously from a state uh, perspective, uh, targeted disruptive attacks on a large scale against um, our private sector or our government systems. Um, there's been plenty of intrusions. There have been plenty of espionage. Of course, every country conducts espionage, espionage against its enemies. Um, but um, in the case of disruptive attacks, you had a couple that the Iranians have att attempted uh, that were very much sort of personal retaliation um, against the Sands Casino, for example, that was owned by Sheldon Adelson, who had made a comment that we should nuke Tehran. And um, in response to that, they, um, they launched a disruptive attack against their, um, the Sands Casino. The, the North Koreans launched an attack, of, of course, against Sony Pictures uh, because they were offended by the, the movie interview from Seth Rogen that um, showed assassination of Kim Jong-un. But aside from those cases, we really have not seen anything significant that was targeted against us. We had attacks like NotPetya that was launched by Russia against Ukraine and then escaped outside of Ukraine and, and did hit major Western companies, but it was clear that it was not targeted. In fact, Russia probably suffered the most outside of Ukraine uh, in terms of blowback on their own uh, companies and their own networks. So um, I do think that there's quite a bit of constraining that's taking place right now um, uh, because um, of two reasons. One, I think countries are deterred. They realize that um, uh, those types of attacks would, uh, on, on a large scale, would have huge response from the United States that would not necessarily be in cyber, and they're not interested in that escalation today. And, and two, there's no strategic reason for them to launch these types of attacks because it really wouldn't accomplish any of their geopolitical objectives. 
Um, you just mentioned the non-petia attacks that had these spin-off effects that, that were unpredicted, you know, that they weren't part of the original target. Um, does that make cyber weapons unique from other weapons? And does it shape the way states decide to use them? The fact that they can have completely unpredictable consequences and affect other states that weren't intended. Do you, how, how do you think that shapes, changes things? I, I think you can say that about any weapon that can have cascading effects. You know, even if you're bombing a particular target, uh, you may not fully appreciate the connectivity of that target to other parts of critical infrastructure and the Im impact it may have. The reality is that um, cyber weapons um, can have worm-like functionality, like NotPetya, where they sort of spread uncontrollably. But vast majority of attacks are actually not worms. They're very specific, very targeted. You're, you're, you're going after a specific system or a specific uh, network, and um, there's really no chance that we'll spread beyond that. So I think that's been one of the constraining effects on our policy debates here in the United States in terms of policymakers really not using cyber offensive capabilities to their full extent because of this unnatural fear that, oh my God, if I'm targeting the you know, Iranian nuclear program, uh, I can have somehow blowback on um, you know, the Western financial sector. And that, that is just nonsense. We've never seen that. Even Stuxnet, um, the actual attack on the uh, Iranian nuclear program, even though it did spread, it, it had zero um, damaging effect on any system except the ones that it was specifically designed to hit. Um, I want to I want to highlight the way um, Dimitri is saying is really important. The uncertainty that surrounds cyber is a bit of a fixed effect, right? And the United States has an obsession with certainty when it comes to its its use of force, and that has severely restrained. We were talking about restraint previously. I think the United States is a place where you actually have seen a significant amount of restraint, and maybe the U.S. hasn't gotten enough credit for the amount of restraint that I think is coming out of the U.S. But a lot of it is tied to what Dimitri is talking about, which is the inability to create certainty in the way that you could model. Um, um, a JDAM, a bomb, right? And that you would have a model where it, which had a defined uncertainty about what the effects could be. Um, so for the United States, I think that has led to a significant amount of restraint. But I just say that Jackie's done some great work on this in the sense of uh, taking war games and asking when will people in war games uh, introduce cyber weapons? And her research shows that surprisingly rare and I think if one way of think about this is if I'm going to send some airplanes across a border and I have to take out an air defense system and somebody comes into me and says, General, you can do it with cyber. And you say, yeah, but suppose they patch the thing between when you first told me this and when my plane gets there, I'm going to lose an airplane and a pilot. I'll go back to just having a nice old kinetic bomb, which I can see it explode, and I can see where the air defense system is at. So uncertainty is a is a major factor, which leads to restraint. That's I actually, about prudence. <laughs> I actually think that's such a critical point, because um, what history shows so far in the use of cyber weapons by particularly our adversaries, since we have been very constrained, is that it has not been a particularly strate uh, useful strategic tool. You know, you look at Ukraine and they've been hammered by cyber attacks from Russia over the last eight years. The elections have been targeted. The grid has been targeted for the first time ever. Uh, cyber was used to actually turn off power in Ukraine on uh, at least two occasions and, and many other disruptive attacks. And yet, over that period of time, Ukraine has only gotten more antagonistic towards Russia, in part because of these cyber attacks, has gotten closer towards the West. So all of the objectives that Russia had to sort of hammer them into submissiveness have not worked in cyber, which is why they're now considering an actual invasion. And in terms hey, of the limits of cyber go ahead, Jackie. If you don't mind, I want to go back to your first question about cyber Pearl Harbor. This, this is where the fundamental problem was. We were thinking of cyber as a substitute for a conventional bomb aircraft cruise missile. And we've been trying to stick it in that hole, that, can, that substitution hole for a very long time, where the reality is the real effect of cyber is in the way it complements these kind of conventional foreign policy means, the way it creates long-term erosion, long-term distrust. Um, and so it, it's been the, our inability to, our bad analogies, which is also probably decrease the effectiveness of the way the U.S. thinks about its own offensive use of cyber operations. To stay on Ukraine for a second, you know, it's not a war game. It's a very real real world scenario that's taking place right now. Um, 
there is discussion will you know what kind of cyber tools will russia use and it sounds like um you know a cyber weapon is not the thing to be looking for it's how russia might use uh cyber operations to complement what they're going to actually do in the conventional warfare uh, arena dimitri do you have any thoughts about about that and what and what we might see and what ukraine can do in response I do, uh, and I have a piece coming out in Foreign Affairs, hopefully soon, hopefully before it gets preempted by actual events on the ground, um, about um, the the um, ability of cyber to complement uh, a, a traditional kinetic force. And I want to make it very clear: I don't think that cyber will play an enormous role in, in in this potential invasion. I think at best it will be a supporting sort of sideshow. Uh, but there are three elements to the campaign where it can be very helpful. One is uh, almost certainly already underway, and that is intelligence collection, infiltration of Ukraine military networks, uh, of their government networks to collect critical tactical intelligence that would be useful to the Russians to target uh, Ukrainian defense forces um, in the initial uh, hours of the invasion with long range fires, um, and also to identify uh, potential um, uh, insurgents um, that uh, would oppose the Russian invasion to neutralize them within hours uh, of the actual crossing of the border um, uh, with uh, traditional troops, um, and also identify um, the flip side of the coin, uh, people that could be supportive of of, um, of Russia that have expressed uh, pro-Russian sympathies that you could put in charge of villages, uh, municipalities, and the like um, uh, when you take over territory. Um, so that 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 is almost certainly already underway. The second element is tactical military support. So to the extent that they can disrupt communications um, um, within Ukraine, targeting their telcos, targeting other uh, mobilization systems and, and inhibit the, the ability of Ukraine to uh, stand up uh, effective defense. I think they're going to do that. Um, a lot of it will happen in the kinetic sphere, but cyber can certainly be very helpful as well uh, to make things more difficult for the Ukrainians. And then the last element is going to be more psychological, and, and we already started to see that with the pretty rudimentary attacks that have been launched against Ukraine last week, with the website defacements, uh, with the wiper attack that really ha had not accomplished a whole lot. Uh, but the goal behind those types of operations is to really try to convince the Ukrainians that resistance is futile, that Russia is everywhere and is um, uh, omnipotent, and that um, um, they can hit any part of the Ukrainian government, either kinetically or through cyberspace. So you, you will see some elements of that, most likely, um, uh, to complement the traditional uh, campaign. And before I relinquish my ability to ask questions, while we have Professor Nye here, I wanted to ask him quickly, um, what he thinks Putin's endgame is. I mean, we're veering off the cyber discussion a little bit, but what's Putin's endgame with Ukraine and, and any thoughts about how um, President Biden has handled it so far? Well, I think uh, Putin has said that he regards the collapse or disintegration of the Soviet Union as a geopolitical catastrophe. And so he wants to restore uh, basically Russian control over the near abroad or the parts that were part of the Soviet Union. And this doesn't have to be full annexation as in the case of Crimea, but it means having a government which, uh, which is going to be subservient to uh, what Moscow wants. And um, so I think he's trying a variety of tactics to try to produce that. Uh, it, it's very uncertain which ones will work and how far he'll go. But uh, that seems to be his objective. Uh, something like he got in Georgia uh, in 2008. Um, but we'll, we'll see. I think, on, uh, I think Putin's larger goal, which is interesting because in, particularly in his use of cyber, it's quite different from the Chinese use of cyber. I think he wants to disrupt the West. In other words, instead of strengthening Russia, which would be a long run strategy, uh, weakening democracy, weakening the West, uh, including weakening NATO, but also weakening democracy inside the United States is uh, quite plausible. And th they view cyber very much for that. But uh, it's not just cyber. If you, if you do RT, Russia t today, if you watch it, you'll see it doesn't cover much about Russia, doesn't even rebut a lot of things that are said about Russia, spends most of his time finding hostile stories in which Western, Western people criticize their own Western governments. 
Uh, so I think the I think Putin's objective is to restore Russian prominence by weakening uh, the West. And the Ukraine episode is is a very dramatic, immediate uh, instance. But I don't think it's going to. It didn't start with Ukraine. It's not going to end with Ukraine. <laughs> If, if I can just add, you know, I think Putin, and I completely agree with Joe that um, he's not really necessarily trying to recreate the Soviet Union, but certainly trying to reassert Russia's um, old sphere of influence over its near abroad and the post-Soviet Union space minus the Baltics that I think they have given up on. But um, in that regard, he's had a phenomenal uh, last couple of years because Belarus, after the fraudulent election there against uh, uh, Lukashenko, and the protests that have erupted um, in that country um, is now very tightly within Russians, uh, Russia's grip because he has supported Lukashenko and helped him to crush the um, uprisings. Um, and Lukashenko now owes him. Um, and that's why we're seeing Russian troops being deployed to Belarus as part of this potential invasion of Ukraine that may be coming up. And uh, just the last two weeks, he has done that spectacularly in Kazakhstan, where you, you seem to have had a popular uprising followed by a potential coup against the president and Russia with very limited commitment of just about uh, 2,500 troops deployed for about a week, they've now pulled out, uh, was able to help suppress that coup and uh, bring Kazakhstan squarely into Russia's orbit because previously Kazakhstan tried to practice this multi-vector diplomacy of, of accommodating China, Russia, and the West all at the same time. That is now gone and they're squarely within Russia's sphere of influence. And I think he's going to try to do that in Ukraine in the, in the coming weeks. Um, so he's, uh, he's on a roll right now, unfortunately. Okay, at this time, I'm going to invite uh, CFR members and Foreign Affairs subscribers to join our conversation and keep it going um, with their questions. As a reminder, this meeting's on the record, and the operator is going to remind us how to join the question queue. Our first question is a written submission from Dustin H., who asks, we've discussed Russia-Ukraine cyber threats and attacks, but I was curious what we knew about China-Taiwan threats and attacks. Um, uh, so we don't know a lot. Um, there's certainly been a lot of espionage being conducted against Taiwan. Um, I think it's a fair assumption to, to, to make that most of Taiwanese uh, government networks have been thoroughly infiltrated by the Chinese over the last 10 plus years. Uh, but we have not seen any disruptive attacks. And, and, and frankly, we have not seen any disruptive attacks from any Chinese government uh, organization ever. Um, it's not because they don't have the capability, it's just because they have strategically decided that they don't yet need to escalate. Uh, I'm confident that at the point that they make a decision to invade Taiwan, we will see a whole slew of disruptive attacks. Um, their um, PLA strategic support force um, specifically has a mission to do uh, cyber operations with a, with a military objective, with a disruptive purpose, um, and they're quite capable to execute um, uh, severe and damaging attacks against um, Taiwanese infrastructure, particularly its command and control networks that could be very helpful to the Chinese um, if they do decide to invade. But uh, obviously, they, they, they have not yet um, gone after Taiwan from a from, from perspective of trying to invade it. So it makes sense that we have not seen any cyber operations that would be disruptive. Could I just add, uh, I agree with what Dmitri said, but there is some evidence that uh, Beijing has interfered with in elections in uh, Taiwan. And in that sense, it's interesting because while Russia has interfered in American elections, the Chinese really haven't, as Dmitry said earlier, they're more interested in espionage for commercial purposes and others. Uh, but in Taiwan, their behavior toward Taiwan on elections is much more like the Russian behavior toward us in cyberspace. Yeah, I wanna highlight that the, the Chinese really do um, have a very different view about information operations when it comes to Taiwan than they do with the United States. They are relatively restrained when it comes to disinformation operations, minus kind of like blatant international propaganda um, against sovereign countries, but they are um, actually extremely active when it comes to building disinformation campaigns targeting domestic politics in Taiwan. That's probably where you see the most significant um, uh, lines of effort from the, the Chinese kind of cyber or information capabilities against Taiwan pre-conflict. Excellent. Our next question will be from Cynthia Roberts. 
Thank you very much. Um, my question is about uh, what you mentioned on the Russians rounding up their ransomware group that attacked the United States. The timing uh, does not seem to be accidental. And I wonder what signal you might be taking from this. Could it be perhaps in response to uh, the threats from the United States uh, regarding deterrence against Ukraine um, making economic and financial sanction threats against Russia as a possible signal to retaliate in the event such sanctions are applied. Thank you. Yeah, as I said, I, I think that's exactly what it is. Uh, it is not an accident, this timing. Uh, the fact of the matter is that for six plus months, we've been asking the Russians to take action against these groups. We've provided them names many months ago. And the fact that all of a sudden they decided to take action now at the point where we're threatening severe sanctions against the economy, not an accident at all. Um, I don't know if you can still hear me, but can you follow up on what kinds of retaliation you would predict in the event that the U.S. Um, you know, applies many of these sanctions? Would they be oh, against the financial sector? Would they be um, against power grids on the East Coast in the middle of winter? You know, what kinds of targeted attacks uh, would you expect to see? Um, so I actually wouldn't expect to see any Russian state-sponsored attacks against our network. I think it would be incredibly foolish for the Russians to try to escalate vis-a-vis um, -vis the United States at the time when they're fighting a war in Ukraine. Uh, the last thing they want to do is bring the United States into that fight. Um, so I don't see them uh, purposely attacking us. But I think one of the things you will see immediately is the release of these criminals that uh, were just arrested. In fact, um, they have the perfect excuse for doing so because they said they arrested them based on information that was provided for, uh, by the United States law enforcement. And they can now say that um, they were so gullible to, to believe uh, the U.S. law enforcement that, that, that made them arrest, arrest perfectly innocent Russian boys uh, that had nothing to do with any crimes. Um, and I think they'll send a pretty strong signal, um, a sort of unwritten signal even, to Russian criminals that now it's a free-for-all. Um, Russia is being attacked uh, economically with these sanctions, and it's time to respond uh, with uh, more ransomware, more uh, criminal activity against uh, U.S. networks. Again, I, I, again, I don't think it will be directed um, uh, by the Russian state, uh, but uh, it will be uh, sort of a, an unspoken message that will be sent to all these groups. Excellent. Our next question is a written submission from Marcos Pascal, who asks, most of the victims of cyber attacks are regular citizens, specific, especially ransomware as of late. What should the nation states do to protect their citizens against these types of attacks? Jack, you wrote about that. <laughs> well, I, I see we all want to talk about uh, <laughs> public-private partnership and ransomware. Um, so this is a really, really, really tricky, uh, tricky question. Um, because I think for the first few, the first maybe even 10 years that ransomware was evolving and coming onto the forefront, there was maybe a misperception by the U.S. government, and I think from private sector as well, that the U.S. government could do something significantly to defend against or deter ransomware. And that, that really just wasn't the case. So what can the United States government do? And I, I want to highlight that the U.S. government has <laughs> less people working on cybersecurity than the major financial institutions by a large order and actually invest less in capability development um, and definitely less in cyber defense than the private sector. So the, the lion's share of capability is in the private sector. Um, that means it's, you know, companies like JP Morgan Chase are actually like pretty well set up to do cyber defense on their own, where the companies that kind of get left out here are the mom and pops or the smaller companies that are basically investing in like McAfee and Amazon Cloud as their primary um, cybersecurity mechanisms. Um, and, and so you, those are the folks that are losing out. The government doesn't have the resources to defend each one of these. Now, I think we've seen some forward progress here. First, the CISA and Cyber Command are now proliferating information about threats instead of holding on to them. They've created a kind of a public persona, public social media. I think that's you know forward leaning. Um, they're also doing a better job of creating information sharing or building up information sharing centers so that there are um, kind of structures so that 
companies and the government are sharing more information than previously. And then, you know, the last few years has been the advent of what the DOD has kind of awkwardly termed defend forward, which I think really is this concept that the United States, instead of waiting to respond to cyber incidents, will instead use their offensive cyber capabilities, which are resident in the military, to decrease the ability of actors to conduct cyber operations in the first place. And you saw that when it came to disinformation and the elections, but now you see that kind of pivoting towards, hey, can we use these resources to um, decrease uh, ransomware actors' access to cryptocurrency, for example? Um, can we use um, military resources to um, shut off the networks or the capabilities that ransomware actors are using? So it, it's moving <laughs> forward. Um, but there are kind of unique lanes in the road that the government has um, comparative advantage over the private sector. And it's actually a very small segment where the government has comparative advantage over the private sector here. Our next question will be from Alan Raw. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, Alan Raw, a partner at uh, the law firm of Sidley Austin. And my question actually does uh, follow up on uh, Ms. Schneider's uh, comments about uh, defensive measures, uh, because sometimes uh, the best defense really is a good defense or, or a great defense. Um, do any of you foresee any technological breakthroughs that will provide um, a significantly enhanced uh, defensive protection or new protocols for defending in terms of internet uh, procedures or otherwise? And do you, what do you make of uh, yesterday's uh, memorandum issued by President Biden regarding uh, cybersecurity for kind of national defense systems, in which there was reference to uh, quantum resistant protocols and quantum resisting algorithms that the NSA was tasked to uh, to address. Is is this a new area that we should be uh, very afraid of, or is quantum computing and other technological measures? are going to be some potential solution to the cyber insecurity we face. Thanks. I'll take the quantum part real quick. So, so I think it is obviously prudent for the United States to think uh, over the long term, you know, there are some secrets that the United States government possesses that it wants to keep secret for many, many decades to come. And if you project 20, 50 years even, um, it's not out of the realm of possible that we will have a quantum computer that will be able to break um, some of the modern encryption algorithms that are based on factoring of numbers and discrete logarithm problem uh, that the quantum computers would be able to break very quickly. Um, so from, from, from just a prudence perspective, being able to standardize uh, on uh, encryption algorithms that would be resistant to quantum computing, which we actually have. We don't need to invent new ones. It's just going through the process of actually um, standardizing on them. Um, is something that um, is a good idea and should be done. It is not something that most people should be worried about at all. It is a remote possibility. It's not going to affect our daily life for many decades to come. And uh, by the time quantum computers arrive on the scene, uh, we will very likely convert to new algorithms that are going to be resistant to quantum computing. So that's the one area of cyber I would not spend much time worrying about. On technical uh, fixes for the future, there are some people who think that um, artificial intelligence may change what's now the conventional wisdom that offense has the advantage over defense. And the argument is that humans make mistakes when they write code. And the net effect of that is that you get vulnerabilities which lead to zero day exploits. And that if you had AI which was checking code, you would remove this enormous uh, vulnerability or set of vulnerabilities. My own view on that is it's probably cat and mouse, that if you got AI on the defensive side, then AI would be on the offensive side as well. And I'm not sure that's gonna solve it. If you ask me the answer to your question, I wouldn't look for technical fixes. I would look for something uh, like develop a real insurance industry in cyber. Uh, so that you have companies internalize the external costs of not having adequate security. Right now, a company says, do I want to have a, have a password that says one, two, three, four, or do I want to have a fancy cybersecurity department? 
And if I'm in compete competition with uh, another company which is going to sell the product for half of what I'm selling, I'm going to cut every cost I can. If, on the other hand, they can't get insurance, uh, if it's something like uh, uh, underwriters' laboratory standards, which are necessary to get insurance, uh, you might find a spread of a good defense, as you put it, uh, throughout the economy. We're a long way from there. But that, to me, is a better approach than, than just looking for a technical fix. Um, and uh, one of the first steps on that is to get more information about attacks. And Dimitri has been working on promoting disclosure and getting uh, companies to have to disclose to CISA um, uh, when they've been attacked so we get a real actuarial base to develop an insurance industry. So I, would, I, would, I think your point is absolutely correct. A better defense is a better defense, but rather than focusing on a technical fix, I think getting a framework in which you develop a, a really effective cyber uh, uh, insurance industry would be where I would put my emphasis. Our next question is a written submission from Mark Rotenberg, who asks, on the resilience front, could the U.S. do more to protect national interests if we strengthened our laws for data protection? We know that foreign adversaries are targeting the personal data of U.S. citizens held by U.S. companies. The EU is known for GDPR, but even the Chinese have recently enacted a privacy law, partly out of concern for national security. I think that, uh, and Jackie has written about the importance of resilience. Resilience is important. I would be very careful about thinking um, that uh, a data protection law would significantly improve our resiliency. However, there is a pretty good consensus amongst the security community that GDPR was detrimental to security um, and um, um, uh, achieved exactly the opposite of what it was trying to achieve, at least uh, on the surface, uh, what the Europeans claimed it was uh, designed to achieve. Many think that it was actually uh, much more successful at uh, promoting European companies and uh, targeting American dominance in the technology sector than it was about privacy or security. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have data uh, breach notification laws in all 50 states. We don't have a federal one. And uh, many companies have reported, of course, breaches of PI information um, publicly. And, um, and yet uh, we're still in a situation where things get progressively worse. I, I want to highlight that a lot of these data privacy regulations are really about creating physical geography in cyberspace. And, and why does China care about its data being in China? So it can control its data. Um, the US could certainly try to do something like that, but that comes with ex extreme costs for innovation, extreme costs for the utilization of data. Um, and I think the central, it, it creates incentives for centralized data in a way that I think is probably less productive for resiliency. Our next question will be from Glenn Gerstel. <laughs> Thank you very much for really excellent discussion. Um, I'd like to focus a little more on the future. Um, given the comments, the excellent comments about the sort of fundamentally geopolitical nature of this problem, rather than it just being a <laughs> technical one, and given that we've been moving so slowly with both the government and private sector and making incremental progress bit by bit on cybersecurity, um, what's, the, what's the future hold? Are we going to be here a decade or two from now bemoaning the uh, continued gap between our vulnerability and our, our, uh, <coughs> and, our, and, our, and our ability to defend ourselves? Is this problem going to get worse? Um, seems, like, seems like it's difficult to envision a situation in which we are going to achieve those uh, geopolitical norms that Professor Nye talked about. What's, what, what's your prognosis for say 10 or 20 years out? Are we doomed to this problem forever? I think you have to uh, predict the future of our geopolitical relations with China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. And that will give you the answer for the prediction on where the, the state of cyber security will be in terms of those threats. Um, and um, frankly, I, I'm not very optimistic that things will be any better 10, 20 years from now than they are today with any of these countries. Uh, I think that's right, but I would add to that that even when you have intense hostility, uh, prudence can lead to limits, which is the 
cases I may mentioned earlier. And um, so I think you may, uh, you may see limited areas of prudence. For example, attacks on the domain name system or the assigned names and numbers uh, that are managed by ICANN and so forth, uh, even if you have great hostility between US and China, for example, uh, it's not in the interest of either of the countries to essentially just rip up the, te the telephone book of the internet, so to speak. So I think there'll be some areas where you may get uh, accommodation uh, based on prudence and coordination, even with hostility in the overall relationship. A follow up on that question in terms of if, if the picture doesn't change much over the next 10 years, Jackie, where does that leave trust and people's trust in institutions, banks, et cetera? Well, this is something that worries me. Um, you know, I have two young children and I look at the future of trust and I, I'm not optimistic. I think there has to be a pretty significant shift. And I think U.S. strategy is going to have to deal with trust on its head. Um, and it's going to have to be bigger than cyber. Um, in order for us to, to move past these threats. Right now, I just see a continuous erosion um, of erosion of digital, um, digital trust in our financial institutions, in our governance, and unfortunately, kind of how we interact with one another. It's very pessimistic. <laughs> but I don't think there'll be a cyber bomb, so I'm optimistic about that. Three, I think we have time for one more question, maybe two. Our next question is a written submission from John Birmingham, who asks, to what extent does cryptocurrency compromise our economic and national security? Look, uh, I think that uh, cryptocurrency potentially has you know, great promises and certain applications to um, uh, optimize our financial system. The DeFi applications are really interesting, but the reality is today, the vast majority of cryptocurrency transactions are either illicit, supporting uh, criminal activities on the internet, supporting tax evasion, drug trafficking and the like, or they're pure speculation. So um, I've argued that we absolutely need to have better regulations, better global re regulations on cryptocurrency transactions. Um, in the United States, we actually have significant amount already. So every, every cryptocurrency exchange in the United States, for example, has to do KYC, know your customer verification, and AML, anti-money laundering uh, checks on transactions because they're part of the financial system. But overseas, that's not the case. And we should do two things. Uh, we should work with our allies to uh, get them to implement um, these standards um, and expand them really from their traditional financial sector, which we've had tremendous success getting virtually every country on the planet to implement KYC and AML in the last couple of decades. Now they need to extend it to cryptocurrency. And two, uh, we've argued at Silverado um, that uh, we should grant the executive branch authorities to sanction any cryptocurrency exchange, any foreign cryptocurrency exchange that is not abiding by these standards and is not cooperating with law enforcement. So you move beyond just having to prove that they're actually involved in criminal activity to now loosening that standard, saying that if they're uh, simply turning a blind eye to it, uh, we, we can still sanction them and disconnect them from uh, the global financial system. for one more. Our last question will be from Bob Grady. Thank you very much. Um, Bob Grady, partner at Summit, the private equity and venture capital firm Summit Partners and a member of the Board of Overseers, Jackie of uh, the Hoover Institution. Um, I wanted to sort of merge uh, Dimitri's initial point that, you know, we haven't seen sort of cyber as a principal instrument of military attack, but it might be a supporting mechanism with Kate's point at the beginning, with Jackie's point at the beginning, excuse me, that, um, you know, it's hard to make societies as opposed to the military more resilient. And my, my specific question is, stepping beyond military vulnerability, do you, do you believe that U.S. critical infrastructure is vulnerable to cyber attack? And specifically, what can the U.S. government, what can and should the U.S. government be doing to make U.S. civilian critical infrastructure, things like power networks, water networks, communications networks, more resilient and, and better sort of defended in the event of hostilities to, to cyber, you know, from cyber attack. Yeah, you know, I would say that there's a good news, bad news story here. 
The good news is that a lot of U.S. critical infrastructure is so kind of is, is built as such a labyrinth, so Byzantine, that it's very difficult to create large scale systemic effects. That's, I mean, like, a, that's a weird externality of having like relatively um, <laughs> not modern or, or kind of like hodgepodge civilian infrastructure. Um, but you know, we're moving towards more digitization and that's occurring not, it has in the past occurred not in a more in a deliberate way. I mean, when you talk to, for example, the energy infrastructure, they would consider themselves as primarily an energy provider, not a technology company. That's very different from the financial sector where they really do view themselves and their kind of future as being technology infrastructure. So the U.S. has had to devote a significant amount of resources to uh, water, wastewater, energy um, in order to try and kind of make these, these networks more resilient. I mean, I live in California. Uh, PG&E can't even survive a sunny day here, much less, you know, like significant uh, cyber intrusions. So, you know, I think there's two ways to look at this. One way is that we penalize these companies for not having more cybersecurity and not being resilient. Um, I guess there's three. The other option is we provide them like with NIST um, guidelines about how to become more resilient and how to become um, less cyber vulnerable and then kind of hope they do it. And then the third is that you penalize. The reality is there has to be probably some sort of mixture here. But I think what we haven't really explored is the ways that we can incentivize and build carrots. There's a lot of talk about regulation and punishment um, for not being cyber secure. But I think there are some kind of carrots that the, the U.S. Uh, federal government can provide to incentivize infrastructures and and to create kind of like a, a, a federal self-help to, you know, really reach out to at the municipal level, because we've seen a lot of vulnerabilities at the municipal level, which is extremely poorly funded, um, to try and increase kind of public uh, infrastructure cybersecurity. Well, unfortunately, we have to end it there. This has been a wonderful hour of conversation. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Thanks to our speakers, both for writing for us and for joining us today. Uh, the audio and the transcript of this talk will be available on the Foreign Affairs website. And that's it. Thank you, everybody. And please join us next time.